Ken Goldberg is Professor of Industrial Engineering and Operations Research, College of Engineering at the University of California at Berkeley. He's also the director of the Berkeley Center for New Media, and he'll be speaking, as you can see today, on new media and the two cultures. So please join me in welcoming Ken Goldberg. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to, um, to be here. I actually spent some time in Ohio when I was um, my father was at Ohio State, so I was here from, uh, my, I was about six months old until about four years old in Columbus, Ohio. So it's nice to be in uh, Cleveland, though, and I was pleased to learn that uh, Clevelanders are uh, very keen to get, their, uh, to get naked. Um, that's a, that's a, that's a new, that was news to me, so. Um, I mean, <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll see how the, it, the day goes on here. Um, and I, and I want to thank uh, Jill and Anne for, uh, for putting this together and uh, also assembling a phenomenal group of people. I was really delighted last night when I just uh, got to the exhibit and saw all the, uh, the luminaries that you've, um, that you've attracted here today. And I want to also thank your staff, um, Megan and, and others who have uh, really been super organized. Um, and, uh, and, and I like Lev's uh, introduction. I'm going to use your model about the, uh, the, uh, the two breath rules. Um, and what you said about um, provoking is interesting. So what I'm going to try and do, and I have um, um, 30 minutes and about 70 slides, and I'm going to try to provoke you a little bit with, uh, with just a few different aspects. The first thing I just want to, I think we should mention here, is that we, we have a new president. Um, and um, so there is a lot of uh, uh, opportunity uh, that I think there's a there, there's a sense in the air that uh, there's that things can um, they can change. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, three things. Um, I'll start with the two cultures idea. So, um, in many ways to think about this, but if you, um, in, in some sense, the, the art and science uh, division was recognized by by C.P. Snow in, in 1959. And the, I think this, this kind of difference in culture persists very much today. The, um, if you go to the Latin um, of, the, of the terms, in fact, um, it reveals a, a real fundamental difference between the two, uh, the two approaches. Um, art is about joining, putting things together, and science is about cutting, uh, taking things apart. Now, those two things are actually interestingly um, complementary. And they, they often work together. Of course, artists cut in order to put things together. And of course, artists, scientists also want to join and come up with new theories. Um, and art and science have had a long history of interactions and uh, interplay. The, uh, the, the, for example, um, the technology of the, um, the, the photography um, over a century and a half ago was dramatic, had dramatic influence on, on art, changed the way, um, as, as Walter Benjamin um, observed that it not only, the question was not, is photography art, but how does photography radically change the function of art in culture? So it, it had, it provoked a, an entire new, our new conception of what is contemporary art. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, someone like Billy Kluver, who was a pioneer in uh, bringing together artists and scientists. And his, uh, his work with Nine Evenings, which has been resurrected in a number of forms in the last couple of years, is still very interesting to look back on in the sense that there was a real, he operated really as a catalyst, and he was able to draw these two, these two um, uh, cultures together. Of course, there are many uh, works that, are, that, are, that have existed since over the last 50 years uh, connecting art and technology. So there's, um, there's Pike. Um, this is a, a Bay Area, one of my favorites, uh, survival research lab. Um, there's, uh, there's Stellark. There are, there's Julia Scher. There's John Simon. I think one thing that's happened in the last, tw maybe since probably, I want to say 10 or 12 years, is the emergence of net art as a field. And it's a, as a subfield within contemporary art, especially r around media and digital art, it was a field that emerged after the World Wide Web. Almost simultaneously with the emergence, artists started using the web as an artistic medium and started exploring how it could be used to convey uh, artworks and, and, and also what did, and, and to critique the, some of the cultural assumptions that were built into the World Wide Web. And I also want to say that it's not all, all digital. That uh, there's a number of interesting issues on media that look beyond digital that have to look at issues like biology and genetic engineering. 
like Eduardo Katz, uh, um, uh, transgender bunny. Um, transgenetic bunny, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, that's what threw me off. Um, and so I also want to say, we, you know, you, you've brought into the, I, I consider the top curators in the world in this, uh, in, in, in new media. Um, Steve Dietz, who spoke last night, and uh, Christiana Paul, who's here, and, uh, you know, who has done amazing things in, in, in putting together exhibits and, and writing and, and really synthesizing um, what, what all this, um, the impact of, of media art. So I'll, now I'll tell you a little bit from my perspective about three stories of my own um, experience. Uh, the first I want to say, as an engineer and an artist, um, this, this has sort of become um, important uh, to me, which is uh, sort of my, my guiding principle, which is, which is to try a lot of things. Um, you know, make mistakes faster than everybody else. And uh, so there, there are a number of projects uh, that I won't talk about, <laughs> but um, I'm going to just concentrate on three that, um, that, that had some interesting impacts uh, or, or experiences for me. And um, my background is in robotics. So I still have a lab at Berkeley, and I have direct students, and we study um, robotics and automation uh, from a theoretical perspective, an experimental perspective. And uh, I was doing this at uh, the early 1990s. I was also doing art projects with robots in, at night um, when, nobody was, when nobody was around, borrowing the robots. But um, I became interested in the idea of uh, telerobots and the potential of telerobotics in connection to the World Wide Web. Now, telerobots has a long history. There's been, telerobots have been around over, over a century. Tesla actually built one, a radio-controlled boat that he demonstrated in um, Madison Square Garden. And <clears throat> the, um, the idea that we got interested, my students and I got interested in the idea of putting a, um, a robot, a telerobot, on the internet so that anyone could control it. And the context we, we thought about as a, we wanted it to be something that would draw participation. So after thinking about it for a while, we decided on making a garden. So, and, and to a large degree, it was meant ironically that um, to some degree that, the, that going out in a garden would be the last thing you really want to do over the internet. Um, but uh, so we built this thing. It was a, we got an industrial robot arm. And we built a planter around it. Um, this was the we called it the telegarden. The uh, the idea was that it had a the cam there was a camera built into the end of the arm. It had pneumatics um, to uh, to control the end effector. It also had um, an irrigation system so you could water um, the plants over the net. This is how the um, the interface uh, looked over the World Wide Web. So you could log in from any browser and you could um, operate the arm. You could move around. This showed you the top view, so by clicking, it would move the camera. So you could explore the garden as a visitor. If you joined and registered, um, got a password, then you were given the opportunity to water the garden. Um, and after you watered 50 times, um, you were then granted your first seed. So there was an idea of a community and that you were, you were part of something. It was also about kind of the contrast between the instant gratification that was so common, still common, on the internet. And um, the physical world, where you plant a seed and nothing happens. So you had to come back and spend time. Um, the, uh, the garden was online for nine years, almost continuously. After we set it up um, in Los Angeles, it was then um, invited to be in the museum, uh, Ars Electronica Museum in uh, Austria. And then they maintained it and kept it online for nine years. Uh, there were a lot of rust and um, <laughs> aphid infestations, and a number of, uh, there's a lot of maintenance problems whenever you have something physical like that. Um, one of the things that was most interesting to, to me that came as a surprise was after about a um, few, few months into it, I got an email from a, from a student who asked, um, how do I know there's a garden? And because I, we had been working with the plumbing and the installation and everything else, it, was, it just never occurred to me to, to, to wonder about that. But of course, it was interesting. And it was, um, it was a, a pretty, the more I thought about it, there was, I didn't have a good answer. Um, of course, as we all know, um, virtual reality is getting more and more um, realistic. Um, and I wanted to, I started thinking about the distinction between virtual reality and what we might call distal reality. 
That is where there is a real a reality there, but it's, you're distant from it. So it's mediated. So in both these cases, you're sitting in front of a screen, interacting with something, but in one case, that thing is completely fictional. It's inside the, it's a synthetic environment. And the other is, um, it's real, but it just happens to be far away from you. And <clears throat> as I wrestled with that question, I, um, it was right around the time I moved to Berkeley, and I met, um, I had lunch with, uh, with Hubert Dreyfus, uh, one of my heroes and a phenomenologist, and I asked him about these questions, and he said this was a very fundamental um, question about epistemology. So that was a, the, the beginning of a project that was an example of research that came out of this kind of um, intersection of art and technology, and we um, worked together on a book that was a collection of essays, and we invited um, six philosophers, six artists, and six engineers to uh, to, 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 we solicited essays from them on these questions and what we ended up calling telepistemology. And uh, the book came out in uh, 2000. It's available from MIT Press. Uh, it also led to a number of other experiments and projects um, that my students and I did in relation to what we now call networked telerobotics. And it's a subfield within robotics and it has about, um, there's a technical committee within IEEE that has about 200 members. Okay, so the second story is, um, is when I moved to San Francisco, of course, everyone um, there, um, uh, I was asking everyone, well, what are you keeping in your earthquake kit? Um, and they would say, you know, what, what are you talking about? What earthquake kit? And, and it was surprising to me that, you know, there's this huge denial around, the, the, around California about um, the, the earthquake. Of course, 10 years later, I don't have an earthquake kit either. Um, but it, it's, um, so I became interested in the idea of sort of creating an awareness about um, the, uh, the, earth, the potential for earthquake and just, and, and <clears throat> in fact, the, um, I, I met the, um, the director of the Berkeley Seismological Lab and they have a seismometer right off campus where Hayward Fault runs right through campus and, <clears throat> um, and became really interested in the idea that the signal was always generating something. There's no, the Earth is constantly in motion. In fact, whenever there's an earthquake anywhere else in the world, um, it gets picked up with a suitable time delay uh, at Berkeley. In fact, the Earth acts as a bell, so it rings for, sometimes if it's a big earthquake, it can ring for months. So I'm really, and then trying to make sense of these signals, and in fact, obviously, the, the, the big challenge is to predict when something is going to happen, and that is um, eluded all of science. So we, we, what we did was very simple. We just made a, a web interface where we, um, we stripped it down and we just displayed this, uh, the signal that's on the left um, on a web browser. And so what um, you come in and the, all you see is the signal, but it's live and you get it um, from, it's generated straight from the, uh, from the Hayward Fault. Uh, we were, after I had that online for about a year, a composer um, approached me. Randall Packer and asked if um, we, we might be interested in, in collaborating on a sound an installation around using the, that signal. So we worked together um, and the result was something called Mori which we then put, this installation was first shown in uh, Tokyo and then traveled through a number of museums. Uh, it was a collection, was, sorry, a traveling exhibition that Steve Dietz put together. And the idea of this was that you were getting the live signal but then it was amplified and sonified by um, a process that, that Randall developed where you, were, you would, for example, this, in this acoustic chamber, you would lie down on the floor and the sound of the earth was essentially um, made audible and then it would envelop you. So it was a very uh, kind of encounter situation. If we, had, if we had been here in Cleveland, I think everyone would have been naked in there. <laughs> um, and then uh, around, as we got close to the anniversary of the, of the 1906 earthquake, um, I was thinking about ways to take it to, to make it more of a performative project and um, was fortunate just uh, by, by luck to be at a dinner sit seated next to um, um, a principal dancer at the San Francisco Ballet, Muriel Maffre. And um, I asked if she would be interested in, in uh, dancing to the sound of the earth. And surprisingly, she said yes. Um, and, and then began a, a saga of trying to convince the ballet director, uh, Helgi Tomasin, that it was a good idea. Um, in the end, he agreed to let us do one performance um, as part of the ballet's um, 
uh, performance that evening, which was uh, almost exactly to the day, 100 years anniversary of the, uh, of the uh, earthquake. And uh, it was at the Opera House, which is right across the street from uh, City Hall, so actually an area that was very um, decimated by the earthquake. And um, we got to, to put it on stage. And it was a, I learned a huge amount about the ballet. It's an incredibly complicated organization. Um, and at the very end, um, surprisingly, uh, and I had never, we were so nervous to, to make sure that everything would go well. By the way, w the idea was we took a live signal um, into the opera house and, and had a, the dance was completely improvisational in the sense that she had no idea what the signal was going to be when she walked out on the stage, which is a very daunting thing for a, for a uh, classical ballet dancer to, uh, to, to, to sort of improv like that. She was incredible. And um, we, uh, we got, uh, and, and then as the audience applauded, um, m to my surprise, she ran off stage and pulled my hand and pulled me on stage to take a bow, which I know um, I, w I did not expect that at all. And so in front of 3,000 people, um, I curtsied uh, <laughs> by accident. I was so uh, flustered. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> All right, and the last story is, uh, is something that Christiane Paul uh, n knows very well. This was a, a project that she uh, commissioned out of uh, the, um, the Whitney Museum in New York. And it was, um, she had an opening in her Artport series of net artworks and um, offered me a slot, which was in October of 2004. Now, <clears throat> it turned out that that was almost exactly 40, year, 40 years um, to the day after the anniversary of the free speech movement at, uh, at UC Berkeley. And, I started thinking, we had been working with um, telerobotic systems. It actually grew out of the, the telegarden, but we were now experimenting with telerobotic cameras around that time. And I started thinking, um, it was also, of course, uh, the, the, the sort of height of the, uh, um, the, the Patriot Act. And do you remember, those days are over now. Um, but it was, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a very scary time. Um, so what we decided to do was to, um, to increase awareness, to demonstrate, in fact, the technology of surveillance cameras, to put one of the cameras um, out over Sproul Plaza, which is the historical, um, this is exactly where the free speech movement um, occurred in 1964. So, um, and this camera, by the way, is a, a new class of cameras, um, surveillance cameras there. Uh, they come with internet connection. All you do is plug it in. It's actually, the price is dropping uh, rapidly. It's about $500, so it's off the shelf. And then you can connect to it anywhere in the world, and you can, you can look around in an environment. So we put this uh, up um, on the Student Union building. It looks like that, so it's about the size of a grapefruit. So you can't really see it, although we, we, did, we made, so our idea was to reveal it, to make people aware of it. Um, and so we set up a website. And the idea of this was that you could operate the camera um, there was a, a panoramic view, but you could select an area, a region of interest, and it would generate a live um, video of that. You, could, it was, it was, you would see who else was logged in at any given time. Um, but for us, the thing that was most provocative was this. Um, the, you had the ability to take an image. Um, so you could, you, could, you could store an image, and it was then part of a record. Now, it, re it raises a lot of the, the questions about surveillance and also historically about what elements of privacy exist in public spaces. Um, and of course, there was also, there, was, there were stories that in 1964 that the FBI had been recording, taking photographs of the, of the students during the, that protest. Um, and so this just gives you a little bit of the flavor. The, the video camera's pretty, pretty good. It's not perfect, but it gives you about the um, number of frames per second. So you could sort of, you could move around, you could look at different things um, to operate the camera. Um, this is an example of the kind of photo you can take. The, um, I'll just give you a sense of the, of the, of the zoom capacity of the camera. This is um, the mid middle level, the, the uh, blue, and then the green is the maximum zoom. So from the rooftop, that's like a minimum middle level, and then this is the, uh, the max zoom level. So we put this out, and uh, Christian knows this. We put this online at about, uh, I think, um, early October of 2004. And uh, it went online. And we, our objective, of course, was to, was to tell people about it. So we were putting out leaflets and signs, et cetera. And, um, and, um, and um, I, I got uh, a phone call in my office that messaged and said, um, the chancellor will see you in his office at 4 PM tomorrow. <laughs> which is um, 
basically like getting called into the principal's office. Uh, so I, I, I figured, you know, um, there was going to, you know, we were trying to create some attention, but um, I, would go to, I got to the office and there was, I, I, in the waiting area, I saw the head of public affairs, the head of legal affairs, the head of the academic senate, um, the vice chancellor, and, um, and I was like, hey, what, what are you guys doing here? And, uh, <laughs> So we, uh, there was a very, um, and they said, you know, basically, what the hell are you doing? And my, my answer was, well, my job here is to make people think. And um, it, was a, it was a tense meeting. One moment, we're, very tense moment was, did, where is your human subject's um, permission for this? Um, which, as you probably know, if you try and do something like that, you can be thrown off campus very quickly. Um, and I said, no, it's a work of art. And, um, it turns out that works of art are exempt from the Human Subjects um, Committee. Um, but uh, there was a big question of, is it legal? And I had, fortunately, I had a, a friend at, who was a, um, actually from Pittsburgh uh, who I had checked in a constitutional attorney. And I said, you know, if we put something like this up, are we violating any problems? And he said, no, nah, it's fine. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> But uh, there was an attorney there. She was, uh, it turned out that she had been from the Clinton White House. She was an expert on the First and Fourth Amendment. A huge, um, so she was hugely uh, uh, concerned with issues of surveillance. And she said, she leaned across the table. She was extremely angry. And she said, it, but is it legal in California? And I just was, had no, I had just never thought of that. And it would turn out that there are paparazzi laws. And so it's what's, what, fortunately, the, the chancellor, um, was very even-handed. He, um, he said he recognized that this was a free speech issue of our time, that he would um, permit the project to go on. He asked me to reduce the zoom level because to a medium level so that we would not be too invasive, and then, um, and then um, suggested, of course, that uh, we form a committee. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, but it was interesting because there is no, it turns out that you know, there, is, there is very few policies on cameras. So any student can stick a camera out of the dorm room and sort of turn it on. And so, um, you know, and, that, and with a camera like this, I mean, a webcam is one thing, but a, these kind of cameras you, you know, are, are a whole different um, category. And so that led to a number of discussions. The professor and I are now friends, Deirdre Mulligan. Um, she, we started working together. In fact, have written a, a paper together. And then we um, collaborated on this uh, symposium that we put on about a year later, um, where we brought in legal scholars and, um, and experts uh, to talk about the issues of what we call visual privacy, as opposed to just data privacy. OK. Oh, and then it led to another research project. And, uh, from the engineering side, we started thinking about could technology actually be part of the solution. And we came up with this idea we call respectful cameras, which is a way of automatically placing um, dots over, uh, basically obscuring the faces of people. So you could watch what they're doing to, for, for security purposes, but you would preserve their identity. Um, and we recognize a kind of um, connection to Baldessari um, with this. And so there's a, a project that's an art uh, that led to another artwork, et cetera. OK. So um, in the time I have left, what I'd like to do is, is just talk to you about what I've been thinking about in terms of um, organizational um, structure, uh, and in particular, the, the, um, the Berkeley Center for New Media. And I should check the time. Do I have another 10 minutes? Or oh, five minutes? Oh, 10 minutes is great. OK, good. So, um, so this is the Berkeley Center for New Media. And it's our. Um, it's an organization that we've, um, that's, that's been around since uh, 2004 and emerged from a competition on campus to identify new interdisciplinary um, research programs. And um, this one is hyper, -dis hyper interdisciplinary, um, where we have uh, faculty, currently we have 120 faculty from 37 different departments across campus. So uh, sorry about the quality of the slide, but there's um, there's engineer, engineers, there's people, many from the humanities, um, social sciences, the law school, philosophy, sorry, journalism, uh, school of information, uh, business. And so it, it's, it's, um, it, br it brings many, many um, perspectives together. And <clears throat> I was uh, um, uh, uh, sort of coerced into taking on the, the uh, the directorship a cup um, in last year in 2007, and um, I started thinking, well, 
the, what, what is a medium? What is our subject here? And um, it's, it, it's I mean, if many people say, when you say, well, we're, we're interested in media, media studies, um, people think of mass communication, mass media. And so journalists, you know, we, you know radio, media is radio, television, um, the internet. Um, but of course, if you ask an artist, you know, what's, a medi what's your medium, they're, they're going to talk about um, acrylic or oil or, you know, what is the materiality of what they're um, producing. Or digital artists will talk about their, their um, machines or mechanisms. Um, so I went to the Latin, back to the dictionary, and um, actually it just, it's, medium is, is middle. It's a, it's a middle element. There's really, it, there isn't, it doesn't necessarily mean communication. Um, or, uh, or material. So I started thinking about it as a uh, medium as a uh, lens, that it's something that um, facilitates um, perception, something in the middle that connects things, and something uh, particularly that, can, that um, facilitates communication, say, between um, subjects or perception between a subjects and objects. And um, so that kind of definition is very broad. So it encompasses what we, what we think of as um, early media, things like the, the alphabets, um, and of course the, the printing press. Um, but it also includes things like the telescope. So the telescope, I think, does function as a medium. It was, a, it was, a it was an instrument that facilitates perception and has dramatic influence um, on, on culture. And now, and, and Marshall McLuhan wrote um, in, in uh, that I remember a line he has, um, the electric light escapes attention as a communications medium precisely because it has no content. And I wrestled with that for a while, and I was, I, but, I, but it sort of started to make sense to me in this context of um, that light is a medium in the sense that it also it facilitates perception after dark. And so has enormous influence on culture. It really changes our, our work day, our, our productivity. Um, so when we start thinking about that more broadly, our our focus at the center is currently on the media of our time, which includes things like um, Wi-Fi, the Wii, and uh, Wikipedia, which are the most interesting, um, and they happen to be digital. But it doesn't have to be. In other words, I want to think about media more broadly, that it's something that is um, abstractly or um, philosophically, a, it serves as this, as this connective um, element connective tissue. In some sense, I think uh, that the, um, the center, the Berkeley Center for New Media, operates as a medium, precisely because it brings people together. It facilitates um, perception um, and communication. I also want to say that because of our, one, one thing that I think is somewhat um, characteristic of, of uh, the Berkeley Center for New Media is that we are very interested, that we have a very strong rooting and base in the humanities. So we're very interested not only in, in, in extending and developing new forms of media and, and, and researching them. But we also realize that as lenses transmit, uh, they also distort. So the critical perspective is extremely important to us, the realizing the, the challenges and the limitations that um, uh, are introduced whenever a new medium comes in, to the, uh, becomes invented. So who, are, who, who has access to that media? Who is uh, enabled and who is disabled by it, um, et cetera? So at the, at the center, um, similar to what Ann was mentioning, we're, we strive, we have a, our mission statement too. Uh, we have various advisory boards. We do a number of, uh, of things, uh, public programs. Um, a number of uh, people in the room were, have been speakers in this uh, lecture series we've been running. Actually, it's now in its 12th year, um, the Art, Technology, and Culture Colloquium. And uh, ev approximately every month, we bring in a speaker from somewhere in the, in the country or the world to, um, to give a talk on what, I, and I always try and emphasize to the speakers, um, if we just took the um, union of art, technology, and culture, then that would cover just about everything. <laughs> so uh, we try and think about the intersection of art, technology, and culture. So if they, we ask speakers to direct their comments toward that intersection. And um, we also are, are, have very actively engaged with research. And so the, the, there, there's a, a number of projects ongoing in the, um, in the center. And this is just a, a sample of them. We actually have a lot of information on our website. The, um, but we're looking at things like uh, the, the phenomenology of second life and um, fundamental questions about um, 
the artistic appropriation rights? Um, can there be a, a bill of rights, if you will, to, for artists? Um, and now, one thing, taking this idea of uh, what is medium even a little bit further, I've started to think about um, ideas um, as media, or models as media. Um, this, uh, um, so in other words, well, so I, I, I gave this talk in a, um, actually, you might have a similar response to someone was like, who is that with a Hannah Arendt? Um, um, uh, he, uh, but, but if we just take two, two, two contemporary theorists or 20th century uh, theorists, I mean, let's look at something like the theory of relativity. It is a, it's a model, it's a, it's a theory, but what it does is it allows us to take um, a, a, a body of data that may not add up or make sense, and all of a sudden a new theory um, emerges, and, all, and everything suddenly comes into focus. Everything snaps into place. It all lines up in a very nice and elegant way. And so it really is like, it operates like a lens. It lets us see in new ways. So theories do operate like that. And so if we see um, media more broadly like that, then all of a sudden it really um, embraces everybody um, in the university. So the humanists, the engineers, the, um, the professional schools, um, we're all engaged in, in, in media in some, in some capacity. Um, now, I just want to say in closing that I, I believe that, I'm, that spaces matter, that getting people together physically um, in new ways is very important. Having institutions like um, the Whitney, um, ZKM, and uh, this is our new building on campus. This is a, a sneak peek at um, the building, uh, the new Berkeley Art Museum that uh, Toyo Ito is designing right now. Um, so this, and this is a, um, a new space that we're, we're working with the directors and the, and the board to uh, develop some new media components to, the, to this space and so that it will be more accessible to the public, hopefully 24 hours a day. And this is a, a space that I'm, I'm uh, excited about. It's a new Jewish museum, a contemporary Jewish museum in San Francisco uh, by Liebenskin. And um, so I'm working with them on a, pro on a new project that I hope to be able to talk about um, in, a, in a year or so. Uh, and then I'll, I'll just say that I, I would love to talk to, to some of you during the day, if we, during breaks and things, but what I'm working on now is um, I'm working again with, with Dreyfus, but um, on uh, Heidegger's concept of uh, technology and in particular, um, what is the essence of technology and this uh, notion of gestell um, or in framing, the technology very, very abstractly um, understood is really a, a tendency to view the world. It's a world view that sees the, the world as um, um, instantly available. And it's a very fundamental, I think, um, insight into, into technology that's, that's, that's not about the machines. It's really about the, uh, it's about a, a way of approaching the world. So it's something I'm working on, and um, I'm, we're at the early stages, but we're, uh, we're, 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 we're going to develop a course on this that will be, next, will be offered next spring. Okay, thank you.